It took many years before women became part of the Minnesota Senate. The first woman elected to the Senate was Laura Naplin in 1927. She won in a special election, filling the vacancy caused by the death of her husband, Oscar Naplin. But it wasn't until 1975 that the momentum of electing women to the Senate began. It started with Senator Nancy Braddis, the first woman to be elected in her own right. Braddis got her start in politics through a friend who invited her to attend a Republican discussion work group. So I went to this discussion group. I was probably the least politically knowledgeable person in the group. I didn't know where my own precinct was, much less anyone else's. And I uh, was sort of a Republican. And at these discussion groups, I learned that you really ought to choose one party or another, or the other, and you should never expect a political party to agree with you 100% of the time, because after all, your husband or wife doesn't. So I became a Republican. As a Republican, Braddis became very active. She became the first president of the Republican workshop in Rochester, worked on Al Quie's campaign for governor, organized the Rochester precinct, and became the state Republican chairwoman. All of this led to the building of her own consulting business, in which she advised many candidates in national races. In 1975, the Senate seat, state Senate seat in Rochester opened up because the incumbent senator had been elected a judge. My husband told me to come home and run for this. This was a great opportunity. Well, I had my first non-political client in my business. It was the March of Dimes, and I was in charge of doing data processing systems for Cleveland and the seven surrounding counties. And I said, well, I can't do that. I'm, I'm under contract. Well, lo and behold, the Republicans failed to endorse anyone at their convention. I spent about three days calling thought leaders in Rochester to see what they thought, because I was aware that a woman had never been elected to the Minnesota State Senate. And so my husband come home every night from dinner and, and he'd say, well, how'd it go? And I'd say, well, they think that I'm a nice person, but they don't think that, that people will vote for a woman. Finally, the third day he came home and said, how'd it go? And, I, and he said, I don't even want to hear how it went. He said, doesn't matter how it went. You know how to get elected. You've been electing people for over 15 years. Now go elect yourself. So I did. <laughs> Nancy Braddis was elected to the Minnesota Senate in 1975, 48 years after the first woman. When I was sworn in, I had a suit on with a blouse. Uh, and I was obviously nervous when I was being sworn in. And uh, Chief, or the, the Justice of the Supreme Court, Sharon, was there sw doing the swearing in. and. Suddenly, there's this loud voice from the rear of the Senate chamber objecting to my being sworn in. And of course, I didn't know what was happening. And I listened some more. And lo and behold, it was Senator Baldy uh, Hansen, who was from Rose Creek, which is near Austin, objecting to me being sworn in because I did not have a tie on which is required of members of the Senate and anybody who is on the Senate floor. <laughs> I know that when I got to the state Senate uh, that I was the recipient of re reverse discrimination. Members, both Republicans and, and Democrats, members of both sides of the, from both sides of the aisle, helped me out when I'd get into parliamentary snarls on the floor. <laughs> I'd have people helping me out in ways I don't think they'd help out a man. When I came uh, to the Senate in 19... Uh, 72, it's 1973 session was my first session. I was elected in 72. Of the 67 members of the Senate, 67 were men. Um, there was not even a restroom for women. Uh, we had a restroom outside the retiring room which said senators only. 
and it didn't need to say that it was a men's room uh, because that's all there were. Uh, Senator Braddis came into the Senate uh, midway through my first term and uh, we had to build a restroom for her because there, there wasn't one. Uh, at that time, the retiring room was for senators only, and of course they were all male, and, and even female cleaning women didn't clean in there. This was a male, uh, male area, period. So uh, the first couple of days went by, and I, you can see, I could see it from my seat, and I was thinking, I think I'll get up and go in the retiring room. Well, I finally did, and uh, there was one black in the Senate at the time, and he was a Democrat, and when he came, he, I walked in, and he was sitting there, and he broke the ice. He said, we've just got to stop all this diversity in this body. <laughs> so he cracked that joke, he being a black and me being a woman. He then became my tutor. He was, he, he, my, for my very first bill that I took through the Senate, and we became very good friends. But I think that women do bring a different perspective, and I think that they bring a depth of thought that is sometimes missing. Not that men don't have this depth of thought, but that it hasn't been quote unquote manly to allow them to show it. And I think that the presence of women in bringing this other dimension, shall I say, has, uh, has really freed men to, to share some of the thoughts that they have had along the way, but perhaps haven't expressed. I did not run as a woman, ever, and I don't think women should run as women. I think they should run as persons, and particularly, uh, you are representing men and women. And I think that it's insulting when women run for political office uh, appealing, quote unquote, to the women's vote. First of all, it's a losing strategy because you're appealing to the people who are probably already for you. The real problem in running as a woman is to, to have men regard you seriously enough and admire your judgment enough to actually vote for you. And to do that, you have to take up what are known as, quote unquote, men's issues. And the men's issues, so to speak, are taxes, bonding, questions that maybe not now, but when I was first running, people always wondered if women were smart enough to get a handle on it. <laughs> and so you should go out and prove that, yes, you are smart enough to get a handle on it. And you're not only smart enough, but that you have some really creative and good ideas, and that you not only have the ideas, but when elected, you'll go there and you'll fight for those ideas. And once you do that, you have the respect of both men and women. The reason you have a state senate and a state house of representatives is it is a place to disagree. It is a place to discuss issues. All of this horror over gridlock, the, people shouldn't be horrified over gridlock. Gridlock is the beauty of our system. That means if it is, if you are stuck in gridlock, it means that the two sides are so equal in the strength of their arguments that they can't come to a conclusion. It's not necessarily bad. It's stylish to be anti-lobbyist. And this is so awful. Lobbyists are paid people who bring facts to legislators. And yes, they bring facts from their point of view. And there is nothing wrong with having your own point of view. Nothing. Now, what? is not being, the news is not being spread, shall we say, to the electorate right now, that you should not hate lobbyists or lobbying because you as taxpayers can't possibly afford to hire the staff to, to gather all of this research and this expertise. I just would encourage both men and women to to seriously consider running for public office. One of the things I find so troubling is the, the news media generally is so busy talking about negative ads, nobody ever pops up and says, well, you know, if it's the truth, it's not necessarily negative. And they are discouraging good people from running for office. 
uh, public service is a wonderful and an honorable calling. And I just think that more people have to start thinking in those veins and, and talking their friends into running uh, for, for whether it's a state senate or the state house or the school board or whatever. Uh, this is an honorable calling. And, and I think that uh, we are in danger of being so cynical and so condescending that we are perhaps going to interrupt one of the finest, finest governmental systems that mankind has ever, ever known. I suppose that um, I regard the, the privilege and opportunity of serving in the State Senate of Minnesota as just a, one of the highlights of my life. I just loved it.